Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inquisitive Brain Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a show that brings you interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Glad that you could join me today as I welcome Ashley Abramson. Ashley is a solution-focused self-love mentor. She's a trauma coach and she has a social work background. And Ashley looks at what she calls the unicorn effect where societal layers peel away, and she hopes to reveal the unfiltered essence of self-love. So today we're going to talk about how you can begin to do that for yourself, her own journey into doing that as well. We're going to touch upon the topic of thoughts that weigh you down, how some words have power, which I firmly believe. How does self-love get lost So I've got quite a few questions for her. And, you know, on this podcast, as you all know, we aim to, you know, interview lots of people from different walks of life, different areas of expertise, and different ways in which you might learn how to improve, self-develop, personal develop, and spiritually develop as you go along on this journey of life. And sometimes our views, our thoughts may differ, mostly they're alike, but here I like to welcome all thoughts. Everyone's learning and we don't all have to agree. We just need to explore. It's always worth exploring. My favorite saying is take what you like and leave the rest. Ashley has an ebook out as well. So I will put the links in the show notes, but we're going to focus on the topic of self-love today. So with that, let's welcome Ashley to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. I want to ask you about how you start, because I know you've got a background in social work. So how did you start to begin to think about helping people in an individual way, I suppose, in getting back to their natural ability to self-love? Oh, you know, that's an interesting question. And I feel like it's actually been my guiding light my entire life but I didn't really know how to fully understand it. I think I had to experience some times in my own life that were a reflection of like, oh, this is about you. This is truly about you going deep within and being that lighthouse, right? Like we talk about the difference between a lighthouse and and a lifeboat. And it's not about saving people. It's about essentially saving yourself so that you can be the light. And so I feel like I always was seeking for for that, but it was really about helping myself and avoiding it, if that makes sense. So I started seeking external. And of course, that's, you know, nobody goes into the job of social work to be, to make money. I mean, bottom line, like you're, you're it, I would say it's right up there with starving artists, <laughs> you know? So it's really a job that you go into because you are seeking something. And I've come to find that now. And, and it's usually you're seeking your own healing, but it's so much easier to heal others. And there used to be a joke in college of like, oh, all the people who are becoming psychologists, counselors, therapists, social workers are actually really messed up. They need that themselves. And we used to joke about it. And there, of course, was those glaring cases of, you know, people you met and you're like, oh, wow, wow. Yeah, that really makes sense. But I look back and it's no longer a joke, but like a aha moment and awareness of like, yes, these people are seeking that or have received that and are seeking another level of it. Many people will say, like, I I came in contact with a social worker, so now I want to be one. But I don't think even that is the case. I think you're then seeking that companionship again that you once had. So you become it. So social work was like my first opportunity as, you know, an adult to choose something that mirrored what I was seeking within. But when I was little, I was a people pleaser. I constantly, I called myself a chame- a chameleon because I was super loud and outgoing when I was very small. And I was told like, don't do that. You stick out, you know, people would make fun of me at school. So I learned very quickly. Um, also an observation of my father who had bipolar to shut that down. And I learned how to read people and I could walk into a room of, you know, homeless people or billionaires 
and I can make friends with any of them because I knew how to read exactly what people wanted in that moment. And I became that. I became that for them. So then social work was like my next opportunity of like, okay, I can become this. Let's help others. And then it morphed. And then I had my divorce. And then my divorce is when I realized like, oh my gosh, I've spent my entire life seeking, you know, what you said, helping others, but it was really about me this entire time. But I had to have that back against the wall moment and realize like, I got, I got to do this work on myself that I've been doing with everyone else because ultimately I'm not really showing up for them in the way I think because I, I've yet to, to cultivate that understanding. So it's more of like a, ego driven fear. I know the answers do this instead of I ha- I don't know your answers. I barely know my own answers, right? It's about listening to that inner guide and removing the barriers to that. So that was like a super long winded response to you. But <laughs> it's really been my trajectory. I think it's always been. And at first I saw it externally until I was forced to see it internally and then really worked on the one that mattered the most. And in that, I was like, I don't want another woman to not have the opportunity to feel this level of self-love, to understand that what she's actually seeking is always within her. Um, And then it's just kind of metamorphosized into you know, working with men and women and building this beautiful community of Big Miracle Energy and a YouTube channel where I really share my journey of unwinding the mind at like a very meta, uh, metaphysical level. And it, it's just blossomed into this beautiful thing. Wonderful. Love your YouTube channel. We're going to come to that, actually, because I'm okay. watching a lot of the videos. So but I want to just touch quickly upon what you said. Two things. One, absolutely. When I was doing my counseling training, we said the same thing counselors or all therapists need help they're all messed up and then slowly but surely through the course because it's a very difficult course any psychotherapy course you do any counseling course it it, slowly but surely we learn actually we're always as human beings we're always going to have challenges it doesn't mean we're messed up as such it Mm -hmm. just means that we've got some experience because of personal stuff We've got some experience in which we can help others. And I think that lends to our ability as a social worker or counselor or therapist in any way, or a doctor even. Mm-hmm. Doctors are notorious for not self-caring. They're notorious for working all the hours on earth and then telling their patients, you must take holidays. You must. Mm-hmm. They're notorious for not helping themselves, but it doesn't mean they're bad doctors, doesn't mean they're messed up. And so I believe I I thought I was harsh in saying, oh, that that I'm doing counseling. It must mean I'm really messed up. I realized, hang on, it means I'm human. It mm. means I want to help other people. It means because mm-hmm. of some of my struggles, I feel I can help other people. Mm-hmm. I need to learn to do it safely, and that's why I'm on a course. But I can help mm. other people. So I think we we learn as social workers, counselors, healers, all of that, we we too need to be kinder about how we see ourselves in that sense too. And the second yeah. thing really important that you were talking about there, which is so helpful about how go, being a people pleaser. So one of the things that I learned during my, uh, again, it's the psychology part is that I have an agreeable personality. Now, I didn't grow up thinking that at all. And that's because of some of, some of my psychic skills. So I was a little bit confrontational. Hmm. But later, I learned that I'm seen as agreeable. But anyway, what I was saying, the whole thing about being a people pleaser, I think, too, we have to examine that as well. Hmm. Sometimes we're quite agreeable. We we like to get on with people. We like things to be calm and nice. We like to find the common ground. And I think if you're a spiritual being, very much like you are, if you're spiritually inclined, uh, then you, you will have a lot of that as mm-hmm. well. But I do accept that we do, we can people please too. I'm the same. Mm-hmm. But I hope that makes sense. Listeners out there, I have a lot of the traits you were talking about, which brings me to, I want to ask you about thoughts that weigh us down. A lot of what you were talking about can be internal. 
thoughts that mm-hmm. weigh us down. So you did a video on that. What are your thoughts about when we have thoughts that tend to oh. recur, weigh us down, shift? We do all this meditation and yoga and then boom, a thought comes up and we're mm-hmm. right back or even lower than before. Mm. Oh, gosh. Thoughts. Hey, that's what we are, right? We're just thinkers. That's, I mean if we went deeper into the metaphysics of my beliefs is like, that's what got us here is the thought, a tiny mad idea. And then this is just a thought in the mind. Um, So that's what we're always doing here is thinking. But I think the slippery slope that we get into with the thoughts is giving them so much meaning, identifying with them. And the second, like, okay, I'm going to share this analogy because I have a client in she just said it so beautifully. So she does EMDR with a therapist and then she also works with myself. And um, during EMDR- For the trauma, because you do trauma work as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, like we unpack at different levels and stuff, but yes, I'm, I'm we complement each other very well. We actually know each other while well, me and the therapist. So it works beautifully. But so she does EMDR sessions. Um And, you know, well, let's just EMDR in general. EMDR is, you know, bringing back up those past memories of traumatic experiences and kind of rewriting the narrative. That would be the simplistic definition, right? Like, do you, I think that's the simplest for a viewer to to understand. But you go back there. Yes. You go back to that moment in time. So it becomes this image in your mind. And then you imagine yourself as an adult go in and help help navigate. But so, which... What she views or what we came to is that that image in the mind is in an interrogation room and her personally, granted, she's, you know, manipulating it and changing the narrative is on the other side of a one way mirror. And she's got two options. She can go in the room and identify with that old you know, narrative and give it weight and space in her time or now here and now or after the EMDR session, she can not engage. She can just allow what happened on the other side of that mirror to then open the door on the other side of the interrogation room and move through. That is how I see placing weight on thoughts or not placing weight on thoughts. She cho- chose not to identify in the moment, which we have that choice. I think so often we think we don't, that like th- that these thoughts are happening to us and they place weight. And I think that's where meditation, it's a beautiful practice if it's a beautiful practice. I think anything that appears to be beautiful can actually be uh, the ego or fear's way to keep you more stuck depending on the weight you place. So if like in meditation, you you get out and you're like, oh, all these thoughts are back. Meditation, that was not helpful. Don't do it anymore right? That would be my invitation in this moment because what it caused you to do is just swing your pendulum. You placed weight on not having thoughts in your mind during meditation, which is just as impactful as the weight of having thoughts. So it's this this middle ground. And I love how you talked about being agreeable. And as a spiritual being, and you said you have some psychic abilities, you you tend to come off as agreeable. And I had this like, aha moment, this deeper knowingness of like, yeah. And the reason why I think we tend to appear more agreeable is because we don't put weight on it. So you appear to be like this people-pleasing, agreeable person when you truly are uh, in a spiritual place of understanding it doesn't really matter, right? Really releasing the weight. So I I just had to bring that up because that's what I envisioned. I was like, it's because you're not placing weight on it. So then someone who is so used to weight needing to be placed on something, right? Someone living in the ego, still very seeing the ego sees you as like, oh, she doesn't even have an opinion. She's agreeable. And it's not that you don't have an opinion. It's that, you know, it's not, it's whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It is what it is. It just is. Perfect. Oh, my goodness. You were so succinct there. Thank you for that. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Because when you do go to that space, but you're so right, um, the weight of it, the the judgment of it, all of that tends to subside when you're looking to elevate your thoughts and elevate. I know there's a different word for it, but... Mm. It feels right just for this for now, but you're trying to get above or past 
some of the harshness, heaviness, weightiness of the judgment. So well put. You're not weighing it. It's not you're not being weighed down with it. And so, yes, yeah, so and so that's where the yes, okay comes mm -hmm. in. All right, okay. I don't have to disagree with everything. Well, your podcast says it beautifully. I, I can't remember the exact words right now, but the statement above, a philosophical, uh, at a bird's eye view. I mean, that's what you're eye. talking about. It's not necessarily, I, I know when you say elevate, that places you in hierarchy, which is in judgment, and that's not where we're trying to go, but it's hard because the words are created out of a place of judgment. But I see it as the bird's eye view. It's like being above the battlefield instead of actively engaged in the battlefield. It's being on the other side of the interrogation mirror instead of in the interrogation room itself. So I love that. And your, your podcast does it perfectly. Thank you. Yes. No, that's good. Okay. And which brings me to power in your words, because I know you, you talk about that. You touch upon that as well. Why is it, why do you think words have so much power? Mm. Oh, you know, this is one of those questions. If you would have asked me it two years ago, I would have had a very personal development type answer. Um, but today my answer is words contain, only contain the power you give them. So it's like we talked about earlier, meditation is not helpful for you if you're placing weight on it either way words, same thing again, is like if you're placing weight either way to the point that it's causing internal disturbance or reaction or judgment or irritation, that means that word like has power over you. So I was on a podcast episode the other day. There was a group of us uh, and one of the coaches, we were t I was talking about discipline of the mind and how it's this beautiful flashlight to see different things. And, you know, it really takes a lot of opportunities of practicing that discipline to see the flashlights of when fear comes in um, before you move forward. And discipline, he, he immediately was like, I don't use that word because it has a negative connotation. And I was disciplined as a child and all this stuff. He says, instead, I'd lean into joy. Um, and I, I said to him, I said, can I invite you into something? And he's like, yeah, of course. And he's also a fellow coach. Um, and I was like, discipline, that's holding weight for you. And even if you choose not to use the word, so it doesn't bother you, the fact of choosing not to use the word is what I call a mouse in a closet. So it's that thing that you're like, oh, bothers me. Put it in the closet. Don't look at it anymore. But the problem is mice when left in closets, turn into monsters. And then they begin to impact your life in areas you're not even aware. So the fact that he has weight on the word discipline could be showing up as, you know, uh, an ailment in his body or the inability to make money or like, you never know exactly how it's correlated. But I will tell you any monster hiding behind a closet door is impacting you. And that's words. It takes us back to words because words are literally symbols twice removed. So we have like truth and then we have what we witness, which is, you know, the, the universe, the image in the mind that this is. And then we created words to describe this image in our mind. So it's like truth, image in the mind, words to describe the image in the mind. So there's so many layers of judgment and ego and control and separation and sacrifice that are weaved into these words um, that are created. That's why, oh, I can't remember. There's a couple countries that don't have words for like self-awareness mm -hmm. and think in it makes sense because why would you want people to become self-aware? So if they don't have a word, then they're not going to seek it. Because that's another thing we're taught is that if you can't articulate it or show me, then it doesn't exist. I mean, hence, that's why we have science, right? Science is like, I have to prove to you. And then, of course, if you look through the time of science and philosophy, like every, you know, I think it's like 80 to 100 years, there's a cycle where all of a sudden what we believe for the last 100 years, we say isn't true anymore. And then we have the new belief. So then my question is, was it ever true? And that's the problem that we really have 
with words. I know I kind of went off on a tangent, but yeah, they're never going to explain where you're actually seeking because if they could, it's like marketing. If any, if you own a business, the biggest thing they teach you in marketing is if you can't articulate what you are selling, no one, it doesn't matter if it is gold, no one will ever buy it. Absolutely. Right. So don't you think that what we're all seeking, if we could actually articulate it, we would already be there? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Hence why a lot of times when you get into these deeper metaphysical spiritual conversations, you end up just almost sitting there in this sense of like, uh, you're psychic. I, I, I've i had some instances where I've been able to like feel things from other people, but it's that moment. It's that moment where you just like You don't have to say any more words and you just both get where you're at. And that's when we use like in my community and me and my partner is like, I just is. It just is like that is like when you end it or like the statement, if you believe in God, God is period. Because the second we try to dig deeper and analyze and judge and articulate is the second we've like went off the path and you're going somewhere else. Yes, I've always thought that words have energy as well. And that, you know, if somebody says, I love you, whatever connection, it's like a trail, whatever connection love has and the meaning it has for you, it could be received as very positive, very warm, very fuzzy. Mm. Or it might be received as, "Uh Mm uh-oh, that person loves me, I better protect Mm -hmm. myself. It just depends on how you, and that's that, but that's similar to what you'll say. It's there's power in the words, Mm -hmm. and I think it's connected to meaning how we grew up, what we believe words. As you're talking, I feel like we should actually be sitting in a cafe in Paris. (gasps) What, yes, because Paris is like my love, I love Paris. We're philosophically putting things, we're really going deep into that. Okay, good mm. stuff. Well, we can imagine, you know, we've got espresso. Yeah. Croissants. Mm, croissants. Yes. Lovely. So I want to go into the self-love part because I don't know, where do you think it got lost for people? Mm. I mean, we know that we know the psychological part of it all, mm. development and all that, but how does it get lost for people? How do they lose the ability to self-love? I think that is such a, uh, I mean, w- we come out of the womb immediately being told that we need someone else in order to survive. You don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong. You, Your internal voice is way wrong, right? Like it does not match this world at all. So I think that self-love event is like, this slow moving takeaway, takeaway. And I was talking to a client the other day and she growing up, her, her family members would tell her, you know, you're no good, this, that, but she always innately knew. She's like, that's not the truth. I know I'm good. But even though she knows that, and she still knows that today, she's running into some barriers in her life. And we unpack that actually a part of her took on that belief that belief that she's, you know, not good and difficult and all these different narratives, but the other narrative might be louder, but it doesn't matter because it's a monster in the back room. So, and then I think what happened is like, as we get older, we take this major detour down the road of personal development of like, that is self-love that, and, and to me, that is lowercase self-love. That is what uh, lowercase love that is separation. That is, I'm an individual. That is my needs need met before I can help you. That is very, this focus of, um, oneness or not oneness of separateness uh, of duality of us not being in it, one being connected. And then we go down that until we realize like, oh crap, that's not what I'm seeking either, right? Like that's why there's millions of personal development books out there and millions of new personal development gurus coming forward because it's never enough because it's not actually what you're seeking. What you are actually seeking is capital self, capital self love, which is this deep knowingness that we are one and you are seeking to heal for the purpose of healing, not to make your external life any better, And it's for the, and it doesn't even have to that you think it's for the oneness in the moment, but when you are not doing it for yourself 
in the matter of, you know, if, if I practice self-love, I'll be better at my job. If I practice self-love, I'll be a better wife. If I practice, because that's looking at you as an individual, but instead looking at you as like, I want to love myself at the deepest layers just because no matter if anything outside of me changes, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I know that really it's my internal state of being that impacts all of this. That's tapping into the oneness. That's tapping into the massive mind that is here in the understanding that, that, that we're one. So I don't know if I completely answered your question, but I think it's been like a whole trajectory of things and then massive confusion, right? Because the, the ego and fear, how do you keep people in a place of control and, and, and stuck? You keep them in a place of fear. So again, like words, why would it be so easy? Yeah. It's not like it, it, if it was so easy, like that's a whole different conversation for a different day, but things would look so much differently. Yeah. And I often wonder too, self-love may not be as simple as people uh, tend to project it especially on social media which we're gonna um, we're gonna talk about because oh, I just... took a break from it which I loved um but uh, yes this whole thing about oh just love yourself mm. just love yourself take a bath okay all that stuff mm -hmm. helps mm -hmm. but it's complicated so uh it may not be self-love for some people may not look the same on others essentially mm. and this is the i suppose this is the existentialist in me which i completely reject most of the time but <laughs> but i'm ex i'm embracing it at the moment i suppose self love if we do, if we're good at it it means we're in less pain and so are we okay with that i uh, many of us many people have learned to feel their very existence by being in some type of struggle or pain or mm -hmm. being aggrieved for some reason. So I don't know. It's a, I know it's a bit one of those big questions, but I'm bringing it in so that our listeners can contemplate, maybe pontificate somehow. Mm -hmm. What is that all about? And, you know, Buddha pretty much said it all. Life is suffering. I have a reflection for that when it yes. comes to Buddha. So I don't know the exact words he said in that moment. But what if Buddha, in fact, was saying, because I, I believe once someone becomes enlightened, it's very hard for them to, well, they can't. They can't see the ego anymore. But what if Buddha instead was trying to convey that what you believe life is will always be difficult until you surrender to what true life is, which is truly being awake from the dream, not awake in the dream. Because Buddha says, I'm awake. And, yeah. and many of the people who were following him then thought that meant like higher level consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, Buddha is so... But he meant... I'm awake from the dream. I'm not even in your dream anymore. Like I appear, this body does, but I know that I am outside of this dream. Therefore, all of this pain and suffering and, and all of that will not impact me. It can't impact me. And that's also what Jesus did. That's why Jesus was able to be nailed to the cross um, because he was no longer playing by the rules of the dream because he was no longer in the dream. He was outside of the dream. He just was projected within the dream. So I would just like ha have people reflect, what if that's what Buddha meant? Because for me, that's the journey I'm on in realizing like, that's what Buddha, that's what Jesus, that's what all of them meant is that in this, what you call life, which is actually a dream of death. So right now you're dreaming of death every single day from the second you were born. It's a dream of death because we do things right. Like look at look at mainstream today is like Botox and liposuction and cryogenics oh, and all this. Like we're every single day living our day to circumvent death mm -hmm. every single day. So that means it's actually a dream of death because that's your focus is death. And how can I not look like I'm going to die? How can I not be reminded I'm going to die? How can I not die? How can I be frozen and, and come back to life, right? That's the dream of death. So what if, in fact, Buddha was saying, like, uh, that's not where it's at. Like, that's, you are not living. This is not life. What you believe to be life, is, it will always be painful. You will never find your happiness in what you are currently believing life is because it's not life. That's what I believe Buddha was saying. Um, and I guess that's why my journey is really about unwinding my mind 
uh, unwinding fully from the ego back to eternal love, back to uh, what we truly are, which is eternal love. Early on in some of my videos, I talk about choosing because that's where my mind was at. I needed to choose love over fear. Um, but as you continue to unwind the mind, it's really about just removing the barriers yeah. to your truth, yeah. which is that of love. And that's what Buddha did. He removed all barriers, all the judgment, all the noise, all the needs, all the earthly wants, everything, and got to the place of truth, the place of remembrance of what this really is. And I'm not saying that people need to go be monks and give everything up because it all happens at the level of the mind. And that's the key. Like, you can go change your external environment, but that doesn't mean you've changed your mind. Also, a Buddhist I'm interviewing soon, so I will be able to ask what their interpretation, because all ancient texts were interpreted. And so mm -hmm. I will be asking them what their interpretation of Buddhist words were. Yeah, And that brings me to the issue of when we're developing personally and spiritually, um, they're intertwined, of course. What are your thoughts about judgment and why we tend to judge others? Well, well because we're, we believe we're separate, right? Like you can only acknowledge separation through judgment, through consciousness, right? Consciousness is the act of observing outside of yourself. And I can only know what you look like because I've judged it against what my repertoire of what blonde hair is versus black hair versus, you know, that like, oh, yeah. It's always this constant sense of judgment, which you'll never completely get away from, right? That's why it's uh, naive or ignorant to say, I don't judge. Because mm -hmm. the point I don't believe here, it, I mean, once you get to enlightenment, then you don't. You're just like, my understanding is it's fully just like one, like Mother Teresa was, like Jesus, like Buddha. Um, but it's about being aware of it. It's about bringing awareness and choosing different, releasing it and not allowing it to hold wait. So your disenfranchised groups, what I would say is like, first of all, when we create a disenfranchised group, it is for the purpose of you have first judged yourself. If you, if you need that group, it was first a judgment of yourself. And then you project it out because that's what everything is here. That's, I mean, therapy, their, their main focus is projection, right? Everything is a projection when you are, your behavior is towards someone else. It has to do with something going on in internal dialogue. That's the same exact thing. So when they are so focused on talking negative about this other group of crystals and blah, 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 it's because they have first judged themselves, but it was too uncomfortable Mind you, this isn't happening consciously. I mean, mine happens more and more consciously because I've intentionally like have brought awareness and, and unwinding it. So it, it's more of a conscious act. Um, but subconsciously, this is occurring. They're like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Project out. Oh, it's actually your problem, not my problem. But literally every problem you see in the world is your problem. Yeah. Because it's actually, because you don't see it. So I, I tell my clients, uh, I either use pink or purple hair. It doesn't matter. Choose. But I say, like, if you're walking down the street right now, let's say you are, and you look exactly as you do right now, yeah. and someone comes up to you and they're like, I hate your pink hair. What are you going to say? Nothing. You don't have pink hair. So you're like, whatever, because a part of you doesn't believe it to be true. See how that is? Things only bother us. When a part of us has already believed it to be true. I mean, have you ever met that person where someone said something really hurtful to them and they didn't even get it? It didn't even register because they had no belief in what that person said. Therefore, they didn't internalize it. It didn't activate their identification already. So when it comes to judgment, judgment is what keeps us all in a state of separation because you can't judge if something is not outside of you. So it keeps us in a state of separation and it keeps us with the ability to project out, with the ability to not look at ourselves and instead to look at everyone else around us. So I think it's about becoming aware and, and kind of, again, allowing it to move through that interrogation, interrogation room and not identifying with it and instead seeing like, oh, 
she upset me for X, Y, and Z. What's really going on? I always say it's a mirror. When you feel prickled or you feel like you need to judge, it's a mirror and it's an opportunity to go within and understand what are they reflecting that I haven't yet to forgive myself for yet. I just like to remind you all to click that like button wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. It really does help with the algorithm and to push the podcast forward. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any streaming platform, please do the same. Like the video, share it as well, and leave us a five-star review or any review, whatever you're thinking. Feedback is welcome. Thank you for your support. That brings me over to some of your work around the ebooks you do. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you're not familiar with the people listening or yourself of collective books, so it was kind of a movement that started, I mean, maybe like forever ago, but really start, got its way under probably five years ago. So really I have written three different chapters and three different books, collective books. So that's where, uh, you know, a group of people come together and they write a chapter about what the main theme is w in regards to their life. And then it's published together. Um, so my first book I did was Lineage Speaks. And it was the, I actually have it right here. Uh, Women Who Carry the Torch for Future Generations. Um, this was a beautiful opportunity for healing for me. So right before I wrote this, I read the book Big Magic. And that's by the writer of Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, she really talks about creativity at a different level. But one of the things in there that really stuck out, and I plan to actually do a video on my YouTube about this, is the story behind Eat, Pray, Love. And how prior to that, she had created or wrote many, many books. I, don't, I think it was close to 20, but don't quote me on that. But it was a lot with the purpose of them becoming a New York Times bestseller. So this takes us back to what you and I were talking about earlier that's little self. Her focus was little self, the lowercase self, her as an individual for gain. Well, of course, they never did anything. They never went anywhere. Well, then she was going through a time in her life and she got an advance from the book uh, company for Eat, Pray, Love because she needed this for her own internal healing just to heal. And so she asked for an advance to pay for this these trips, right, that are in Eat, Pray, Love. And she said, I'll write about it along my way. But her whole motivation was like, I need money so I can go do this trip and so I can heal. No motivations of best time be or New York Times bestsellers, none of that. And we all know what happened with Eat, Pray, Love. Julia Roberts is in this amazing movie. It was on the national bestseller for, I think it was like eight months in a row. Uh, beautiful thing. But because her purpose wasn't for that of self-gain, by healing ourself, the capital self, with no expectations of outcome, doing for self actually impacts the one when you truly just do for self. So the reason why I bring that up is lineage speaks. I, you know, of course, grappled with, oh, it should be this. It should look like that. It should look like this. And then I listened to Big Magic and it was, gosh, I, I waited till the last minute to do this chapter. Like literally, I think I even asked for a day extension. But um, I was like, I need to do this for my own healing. And it was around my dad I had decided. My father had bipolar. And if you're interested, um, I sell the ebook of all my books on my website. I, I put them together into one book. But I was like, okay, I'm going to write a letter to my dad. And I messaged the woman who put the book together. And I said, hey, I need to just do this for my healing. Is it okay if I just write a letter to my dad? And that's my chapter. And she said, yeah. And it, had, it was the most healing experience to write it, then to read it. And then to read it out loud for an audible book as well. And, you know, I've had many people say they've read it and it's, it's wonderful. And of course, it's not like a bestseller, but my only intention was to heal myself. And it did that. It, I mean, I had done tons of deep work around my inner child and didn't even realize this was like the final chapter. This is uh, a chapter to my father. It, it's about our journey together. Um, on earth when he was alive and then our journey together as he has gone through my perspective, right through, through me. And so it's called earthly hugs and soul kisses. And that was my first book. And then my second book I did was really about social workers and going rogue. 
you know, being the social worker that left, the intention of that book was to really give people in college or later an opportunity to understand um, the truth about social work, like what it really is like, uh, not from the textbooks, but from the people actually in the trenches. Um, and then the opportunities that it holds, like why do we go into it? What do we do when we're in it? And what if we want to move through it and out it and utilize what we learned? Um, so that's like journeys in, through, and out of social work. So I'm in that one. Um, and then Divinity Speaks, is my self-love journey is um, really about moving through the lowercase self-love and entering into the capital self-love. Um, I had a lot of wounds from my grandfather and my father and my stepfather um, and in that healing process and then really going on that journey of that deep internal self-love and, th and then, you know, finding my partner today. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I find I really don't enjoy writing that much. I'll be honest. It's not something I seek out. Um, it's It finds me. And it's interesting you brought this up because I've been on so many podcasts and not many people will bring up the books. They'll just say like, oh, she's you know been in a few books. So I love that we're chatting. But it's interesting because literally two days ago, I had a friend reach out and she's like, my friend, I would like you to be a part of this collective book my friend is writing and she wants you to write you know, your rising from the ashes moment, which was actually my first business names, Phoenix Rising. And I've yet to really write about my actual divorce. So it always finds me when it's time for like that next level. But otherwise, I'm a talker. That's why I'm in my YouTube. I I, I verbally process. Um, and that's how my YouTube came about. It's really like my journal. I, I know in giving is receiving. As we become the teacher, we become the learner. So when I create these videos, it's usually me grappling with some concept. And it's my ability to articulate it and to like see it come out and then allow it to like move back through. And, and I was like, well, you know, it helps me here, throw it out on YouTube and, and see if it impacts anybody else. It's no harm, no fall. And I go back and watch them. I, I don't know. People will probably be like, oh, that's arrogant. But it, it's interesting when you actually do things from a place of spirit, how much you don't feel like you're there. Because when you go back and read things that you've written when you're inspired or you watch things, you're like, who's that? That's not me. Like, who did that? So that was a very long winded answer for my books, but there you go. <laughs> Why the guitar? Oh, when I put them all together. Yeah, so that's the one where it's all three of my books together on my website. The reason why is, so that was a very in spirit connection. I don't play the guitar. We were taking photos out in St. Pete and just this marvelous connection happened with a guy walking by and he offered up the guitar, but it, it like so much came from that afterwards for my photographer and myself. It was a representation of just fully trusting, right? So many people, if a random guy came up and said, Hey, I mean, I don't, that guitar is worth a lot of money. For him, someone to be like, hey, do you want to use my guitar in this photo shoot? How often would someone just be like, oh, no, that's okay, right? Because that's what we're taught. But instead, me and the photographer leaned in and we're like, oh, well, that would be really cool and made this amazing connection. But it also got to encompass like the childlike spirit that we all are, not childlike, we are. We're all defenseless children. So we're always full circle. I think we're always learning as well fascinating journey but Ashley this has been amazing I mean if some so when people come to you for help about things what, what do they normally come to you about what do they normally say I'm sure it's a mixture of things but I mean it is a mixture of things but I'm finding more and more that people are really at this back against the wall moment they've tried a lot of like the personal development techniques they've done a lot of uh, searching in that manner externally. Um, because, you know, when people come to me, many coaches or guides today will be like, I have your blueprint, I have your answers, but I don't. And I really redirect you all the time to not. Um, right now in the mastermind, we are, it's really about realizing our answers are within. These are, these are women that have ingested tons of personal development in their lives, just like myself. And now it's about like remembering and unlearning a lot of the personal development and remembering you don't need any of that. So it's a constant redirection and 
discussion with uh, coming from a place of love instead of fear of like, we don't need this. We don't need these suggestions of books or, or this or that in this space. So that's really what I hold is a space that's like clean and simplistic, but so powerful. So the people that tend to find their way to me are really ready to, to just shed to shed the layers and and to not be continuing um, to pack on more layers or false senses of certainty or security, but to just really, really get to that that gut wrenching truth and honesty and and deep, deep self awareness. So my one on one is a six month minimum commitment, and we meet weekly. Um, and then after that, there's discussion of what potentially makes sense for you. Um, and then my mastermind currently, we open the doors every three months. There's, uh, the max amount of people is eight people at a time. Um, there's discussion of opening another group once we have filled that and consistently fill it. Um, it just started April 1st was like the kickoff. Um, but that opens every three months. So that opens again in July. That really has a, an intensive interview process of understanding just where you are at. Not that we want to judge, but also it's a space for people that um, are truly not seeking answers externally and really have done a lot of the deep awareness work. Because as you know, when you bring someone into a therapeutic practice that they're not ready for, it can actually be more harmful. So what's the purpose? Um, my mentor she teaches uh, professional dangerousness when it comes to like social services and things like that. So I'm very cognizant all the time of the amount of harm I can do in the process of the help that we can be doing as well. In the mastermind, we will be having at least every six months where we have an in-person weekend together. Um, so we have that. And then you know, there's other ways as well. I have my YouTube channel and then I also have a Patreon where we have two live discussions a month and that's with me and my partner. And that's really focused around deep diving of the metaphysics and unwinding um, of the mind and, and finding our way back to truth. So yeah, there's a lot of different, and I'm always open. I think I really just am at a place in my life of complete surrender um, and, and working every day to not plan but to instead allow myself to be guided and receive the inspiration in the moment. And, you know, so today that uh, I give you this vision and anybody listening, that doesn't mean that's what my vision will be in a week. So I encourage you to just email me and, and, and we'll have a discussion because if I feel guided by spirit to whatever you are imagining for us to co-create, then okay, let's do it. Yeah. So I'm always birthing new things and always allowing other things to be shed. And that's really my wish for my channel is, you know, I share what I'm grappling with and, and, and what my beliefs are, sh are shifting to, but that's not the purpose of my channel. My channel isn't the purpose of where you go watch and Ashley's a guru and you learn from her, but it's like this permission channel. Like you, you enter into my channel and I give you complete permission to dissect whatever it is because I'm doing it. And just because I got to a place for myself doesn't mean that's where your place is. But guess what? We just started to dissect together and you have permission to go on further. So that's really, that's really where my heart was. And that is like, I'm just going to be open and show you that like, I'm dissecting God and what is this universe and who is Jesus and, you know, all the taboo things that we're told, this is your options. That's it. You can't ask any more questions. You either go to church or you go to temple or you go to synagogue, you know, any of those, that's your options, no further. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.